welcome to the Global Institute at Long Island University's State of Anti-Semitism. Uh, when I left Congress, and I, I think I left at the right time, uh, my, my dream was to create a place on Long Island where we could really delve into the extraordinary array of new challenges and crises and complexities in the world. For most of my time in Congress, uh, I served on the Armed Services Committee and the Defense Appropriations Committee. Most of what I did in the House of Representatives had to do with national security and foreign policy. And I learned that when things reach a certain level, when moments reach their climax, what happens is the military affixes an acronym to that. The military, they're experts at acronyms. And so the times we're in, ladies and gentlemen, the world as we see it now, actually has an acronym devised by the United States Army. It's called VUCA, Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. And I wanted a place where we could not deal with sound bites, and I say this as somebody who's on CNN, and not deal with the screaming back and forth, but I wanted to create a place where we could really understand and delve into that VUCA, those complexities. And Long Island University was kind enough to allow me to create our global institute here. And we have three missions. Number one, uh, we provide connections to foreign leaders. And so Colin Powell was here, and President Clinton is coming here, and General Petraeus will be here. We have members of Congress and diplomats and world leaders coming through here. This is the place on Long Island to connect with the people who are making decisions that are shaping and reshaping our world. And secondly, we travel. Next year, we're uh, we have plans to visit Cuba, to visit Israel, to visit Normandy, uh, India, uh, and elsewhere. And third, we study and educate uh, on major issues and challenges in the world, and tonight we have the opportunity to study and educate uh, on the issue of anti-Semitism. Uh, LIU also gives me an opportunity to do what I love, which is to write. Uh, in Congress, I le led a life of politics sprinkled with creativity. Now I lead a life of creativity sprinkled with politics. And, uh, you know, the rabbi was kind enough to plug my books, uh, Global War and Morris, which was published two years ago, Big Guns Comes Out. But there's a book that I wrote, my first book, none of you have ever heard of, and it's pertinent to what we do tonight. Great Jewish speeches throughout history. I, I, I was always intrigued about the relationship between the Jewish people and speaking the truth to power. Always fascinated me. And so I went through Jewish history and found the speeches that were seminal, speeches that were important, speeches by people who were under extraordinary stress and helped make life better for their followers. Uh, and I learned that uh, biblical history features debate not only between Jewish leaders and secular leaders, but between Jewish leaders and God. My name is Israel, derived from Jacob. You know the story. Israel is to contend with God, to challenge God, to wrestle with God. Uh, Moses argues with God about confronting Pharaoh. Abraham argues with God. He debates God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He actually negotiates with God about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Book of Job is an argument with God. And it occurred to me that if Jews can speak the truth to the almighty power, then we also have an obligation to speak the truth to lesser powers. And uh, in my research, I learned this in terms of speaking the truth to power and confronting challenge. You know, we're called the chosen people. Those of who are Jewish, we are called the chosen people. But I always wondered, you know, chosen for what? And, and, and the rabbis here, they're much better and much more scholarly than I am at this stuff. But my own view was that what were we chosen for? And in my view, as a politician, we were chosen to uphold a certain moral commitment. We were chosen to uphold justice and fairness and liberty. And when you think about it, if you follow the history of despotism and tyranny and dictatorship, if they want to advance their aims, they've got to go through those people who are putting up a barrier to despotism and tyranny and injustice. And it was the Jewish people, for most of our experience, who put up that barrier. So to get to their evil aims, they had to eliminate, they had to annihilate, they had to expel, they had to persecute, they had to segregate those who were upholding those standards. Uh, the Egyptians did it to us, the Amalekites, the Edomites, the Greeks, the Romans, Jews were expelled from England in 1290, expelled from France 1306. August 8th, 1492, two things happened. Who knows? 
That was the day by which the last Jew had to leave Spain, and it was also the day that Columbus set sail for America. And then we had ghettos and pogroms and Kristallnacht and crematoria and mobs in Chancellorsville screaming, Jews will not replace us. And so Jewish history teaches us that there is evil in the world and in our country, and when there's evil, we must confront it. That there are cycles of anti-Semitism throughout our history, and when we see those cycles, we must push back on them, and we must act. And that is what this conference is all about. This conference is making sure that our synagogues and our Jewish communal institutions and our homes are safe, and we have assembled the best panel that you could ever hear from, from federal, our partners at the federal government and county law enforcement. They're going to tell you practically what needs to be done to keep us safe and secure. It's about understanding the history and the depth of anti-Semitism in the past and the future, and it is about understanding that any form of bigotry or prejudice, any form against any people, requires those of us who have faced it before to face it down. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you look like, what your orientation is. When there's bigotry, we have our own obligation. We who are victimized have to stand up uh, for the victims. Tonight uh, isn't uh, a scholarly or esoteric study of anti-Semitism, ladies and gentlemen. It is about our past. It is about our future. It is about our security as Americans, as Jews, as American Jews, and it begins here. I want to introduce our first speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Ambassador Danny Diane. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. You know, some conferences on anti Semitism sometimes are enjoyable. There is this uh, tale about two. Jews that were traveling on a train in Poland, or maybe it was in Germany, and one of them was reading an anti-Semitic newspaper and smiling and laughing out, laughing out loud. And the, second, the other Jew was puzzled by the behavior of his friend, says, what are you laughing? You are reading a terribly anti-Semitic newspaper. So he says, yes, you know, when I read a regular newspaper, I see that we are persecuted and massacred and killed. When I read an anti-Semitic newspaper, I see that we run the world. <laughs> we dominate the world. Um, but it's a serious issue. It's a very serious issue, and I would like to share with you the fact that uh, I spent uh, the last Shabbat in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I spent the Kabbalat Shabbat, the traditional Friday evening ceremony and meal with the students and faculty and the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, We're adjacent to the grounds. I, I learned uh, that in the University of Virginia there is no campus, there are grounds with a capital G and they don't know even the word campus, so the, ca the ground that was desecrated with the Nazi flag three weeks earlier. And then uh, on the Shabbat morning, uh, I was with the congregation Beth Israel uh, in their uh, beautiful small synagogue that stands in uh, downtown Charlottesville uh, since the 19th century, um, a synagogue that uh, miraculously, miraculously uh, was not attacked by the militias, the armed militias that marched uh, chanting anti-Semitic slogans in the streets of downtown Charlottesville. And I told them and the congregants in Charlottesville, and I tell you, my friends, that for the state of Israel, an anti-Semitic incident, even if it happens 6,000 miles from Jerusalem, is local issue, is a local, a domestic issue, is local news. And I asked myself, what is the significance of those two words that we pronounce so often, never again? 
have their, do they have a real significance or they became an empty, shallow cliche? Because if these words do have a significance when we pronounce them, then uh, it puts on our shoulders some obligations. It puts, for instance, the obligation to oppose vehemently and actively a genocidal regime in Tehran that uh, is determined to develop nuclear cap military capabilities in order to exterminate the Jewish population of Israel. You know, the nuclear agreement with Iran, you can analyze it in many ways. For instance, centrifuges and the enrichment and uranium and the heavy water. But for me, the most poignant thing in that agreement is the fact that the family of nations received with open arms a regime that is clearly and openly anti-Semitic. Those, by the way, are not my words, are the words of, of President Obama that called Supreme Leader Khamenei an anti-Semite, and an autocratic regime, if an anti-Semite is the Supreme Leader, by definition the regime is anti-Semitic. Nevertheless, uh, they are being received in the community of nations with open arms, and uh, there is a long line of business persons and, and, and leaders of the world uh, marching on the red carpet in the, Tehran, uh, in the Tehran International Airport to do business with them. And never again also means that we cannot uh, condone the delegitimization of the State of Israel that is undoubtedly uh, done in order to facilitate, in order to legitimize the wiping out of Israel uh, from the map. But never again is first and foremost, first and foremost, the eradication of Nazism, the most evil ideology that mankind ever knew from the face of Earth. So when Nazi flags were displayed in the cities of an American town of Charlottesville, Virginia, there are no considerations of if and but and maybe and this is worse or that is worse. This ideology that brought upon the massacre of six million Jews, one third of the Jewish people, is so abhorrent so repugnant, so dangerous, that when we see it displayed, be it in Charlottesville, Virginia, or in Whitefish, Montana, or in other places around the globe, the supreme commandment is first and foremost to combat it. Nazis, Nazism, neo-Nazism, white supremacism cannot have a place on the face of earth. I said that uh, an anti-Semitic act, an anti-Semitic threat is domestic issues for Israel. An affront against a Jew or a Jew is because of his or her Judaism is an affront against every Jew and against the state of Israel. That obviously does not mean that we can uh, apply, uh, defend every Jew or be on the ground. The responsibility is the responsibility of the local, state, and federal authorities in, every, in each place in which an incident that happens. Standardly, of course, is the responsibility of the countries, of the, the states, and we will make sure, with all our diplomatic leverage that we have, that countries take that responsibility as they should, including the United States of America.
I want to conclude uh, by reading a letter uh, wrote especially for you by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, to the Long Island University, to the Global Center, and to you personally, Congressman. And Prime Minister Netanyahu asked me to convey to you the following message. Dear friends, I send warm greetings from Jerusalem to the State of Anti-Semitism Conference. I must be sincere, he sends his greetings from Bogota, Colombia at this moment. <laughs> Hatred of the Jewish people is not new, but over the centuries it has taken different forms and spread through different means. To date, much of this blind hatred is spread online. Regardless of how anti-Semitism spreads, we must always confront it. Whenever, wherever, anti-Semites and other bigots spew their hatred, they must be challenged, they must be defeated. I applaud you for raising awareness about the importance of this fight and for sharing strategies to win it. We will never relent in the struggle for truth and tolerance. I wish you a productive and meaningful conference. Sincerely, Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of the State of Israel. Thank you so much. Another big hand for the ambassador for his leadership. Thank you for being here. Evan Bernstein is the New York Regional Director at the Anti-Defamation League, and he is responsible for all initiatives across New York State. Ladies and gentlemen, Evan Bernstein. The EDL the mission, the mission of the EDL is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. And it's, uh, we're one of the oldest civil rights organizations in the country, being over, over 103 years old. And the mission, um, the dual mission, is something that we take very seriously. And right now, at a time in our country's history, uh, business for us is at all-time high, unfortunately. The work that we've had to do, not only in fighting anti-Semitism, but securing justice and fair treatment for all, is, is taking up uh, so much of our time that I've actually had to give rolling time off to some of our staff because of the amount of incidents that we're having to handle and, and the intensity of these incidents. To, to put it in perspective, I think it's important to, to talk about some of the numbers of what we're seeing right now in regards to anti-Semitism here. Uh, locally uh, in, in the state of New York, specifically in this area of New York City and Long Island. Uh, as of this week, the NYPD has tracked 111 anti-Semitic hate crimes in the five boroughs in 2017. That's a 40% increase relative to the same point last year. The NYPD has logged 278 hate crimes so far for 2017. This is also a 34% increase compared to the 208 committed until early September in 2016. Nearly 40% of all the hate crimes the NYPD has tracked this year are anti-Semitic in nature, 40%. This is not just a New York City issue. Long Island was home to a third of all the anti-Semitic incidents that the EDL tracked in 2016. Some of the events that we've seen here locally in Long Island just in the last couple months include anti-Semitic comments shouted at a local couple that was walking down the sidewalk. Swat stickers have been carved into an elementary school not far from this campus. I can give you a list of things that have happened here in Long Island just in the last few months. Syosset continues and continues and continues. Many of the incidents in Long Island have involved vandalism, and a lot of them are spray painting of swastikas and other types of anti-Semitic um, language, like down with the Jews. And in fact, our audit of anti-Semitic incidents shows the instances of anti-Semitism, anti anti anti-Semitic vandalism have surged by 50% in 2016, and we're compiling our numbers now in 2017, and I can tell you the numbers don't look good. And those are the numbers. And it's easy to take, especially in an academic institution here like LIU Post, to look at things from a, uh, you know, from a quantitative standpoint. But there's a human aspect and a human element behind these numbers. 
So we compile the numbers, but we get intake and we have conversations and we're dealing with these people on the ground. Numbers don't capture what happened this Sunday when I'm playing with my son with Legos and I get contacted by one of my board members whose neighbor, an elderly neighbor, walks out in Riverdale into the front of his house to get his Sunday New York Times and turns around and sees the word Jew spray painted on his door. He's not, the person was not overtly Jewish, not Orthodox, didn't even have a mezuzah on his door. The entire community there is uh, clearly very shaken. The family didn't even know what to do. Thank God the ADL board member was there, contacted us, were able to get in touch with the Hate Crimes Task Force at NYPD, and the ball got in motion. Now it looks like they found video of the perpetrators, and hopefully they'll put a close to that, that case. But numbers also don't capture the Orthodox Jewish man who this winter had chunks of ice hurled at him by two teenagers in Brooklyn. The numbers don't capture the fear of an elderly woman in Manhattan and what she must have felt when her neighbors yelled at her, Nazis did not kill enough of you. That's why it's so important to look beyond the numbers because these, these, these events have true impact in our community. There's people that are being affected by this. We get so many calls, the intake calls that our staff gets from individuals that are, these are just, it's just a small sampling of what is happening right now in New York. Anti-Semitism and hate crimes affect not just the victim, as I said, the broader community as well. And when someone's attacked or targeted just because they're Jewish, it leaves the whole community feeling afraid, isolated, and vulnerable. When any minority is, is singled out like a Jewish person is, other minorities, whether you're Hispanic, LBGDQ, African American, everybody feels it. Everybody has a sense of fear. Is it gonna happen to me next? Am I gonna be the next person that's gonna be targeted? Now is the time for action. Now is the time for people to start continuing, to really start in, and continue to report hate crimes. We have such a tremendous relationship with law enforcement. The ADL is the number one non-governmental trainer of law enforcement in the United States, and we have such an amazing relationship with Long Island uh, police departments, Suffolk, Nassau, and beyond. It, it's such a cherished relationship, and we want to thank, I know the leadership is here, and we want to thank them for all the work that they do. Really, that's great, give a hand. But one of the things I hear the most from, from law enforcement are people are terrified sometimes of actually reporting a hate incident or hate crime. You must report, you must stand up and report. You can't be, let it go. Police have to know, community leaders have to know, elected officials have to know, it's the only way they're gonna be able to protect you and protect others from these kind of things from happening. Now is the time to get anti-bias trainings in the schools. This rhetoric that we're seeing since the election season, it's imperative that young people do not, do not believe that this is the new normal. We cannot let that happen. We must do everything in our power to push our, our community leaders and our elected officials to try to make it mandatory for us to get as much education into every public school, every private school in our community. Because if we don't educate young people, this, this is gonna be a problem that's gonna metastasize in ways that we've already started to see. This cannot become the new normal on Long Island. It cannot become the new normal in New York City. And it cannot become the new normal in New York State. And I really hope that all of you here, this is a great step, and I know you're here because you're engaged and you want to learn more about anti-Semitism and what's going on, but hopefully this is step one, not the last step. Get engaged. Don't just talk to your peers on Facebook. Don't just post to your friends. Get out there, get engaged. Get engaged with elected officials. Get engaged with law enforcement. Become a leader in your community and be an army of people that are going to help push back on this trend that we're seeing right now. Thank you so much. I want to, in introducing Professor Lipstadt, take you behind the scenes for a moment in the United States Congress, which led to my introduction to the professor. Remember at the beginning of this program, uh, I told you that I served on the Armed Services Committee and the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense. And as a member of the Armed Services Committee, uh, I had received a phone call from a young man uh, at the U.S. Air Force Ca Academy in Colorado Springs, who told me that uh, at the Academy, uh, several weeks before, uh, an Air Force chaplain uh, had compelled him to go to a church service. And I said, well, what do you mean he compelled you? 
Uh, and this young man said to me, well, he told me that if I didn't go to the service, I would burn in the eternal flames of hell. Now, this is a military chaplain paid for by the taxpayers talking to a young man who was willing to go down in flames on his plane to protect our freedoms. And so I looked into this and learned that, in fact, at the time, there have been vast improvements since, but at the time, uh, there was a very serious and dangerous culture of coercion uh, at several of our military academies. In the case of the Air Force Academy, uh, there was something called heathen flight lines, where if you refused, no matter what your faith was, or no matter what your faith wasn't, if you refused to attend Sunday church services, you were forced to march back to your dorms on what was called a heathen flight line. Uh, we learned that um, cadets were required as part of their instruction to attend a screening of Passion of the Christ, but when some cadets asked for a screening of Shoah by Steven Spielberg, they were told that that wasn't appropriate to be viewed at the Air Force Academy. And so on the Armed Services Committee, I decided one day to offer an amendment, and the amendment I thought was a political slam dunk. This is what it said. Uh, the Armed Services Committee respects the right of chaplains of all faiths to preach in accordance with their beliefs. But we expect chaplains of all faiths to demonstrate at all times sensitivity, tolerance, and respect for other faiths. And the reason for that is because you can't have a chaplain for every religion in every operating theater. It just can't be done. And so there may be moments, ladies and gentlemen, as sad and as sober as it is, there may be moments when a young soldier is clinging to life in the hands of a chaplain who doesn't share that soldier's faith. You want that person, that service person, to feel comfortable in those moments. And so I offered this amendment, and I thought it was going to be unanimous, and it was defeated. An amendment simply saying, demonstrates sensitivity, tolerance, and respect to all faiths. And I went to the floor of the House, this was in committee, I went to the floor of the House and I began talking to some of my colleagues who voted against it. Uh, where I learned that while that might not qualify as an overt act of anti-Semitism, it certainly reflected, that vote reflected an ignorance and a glaring insensitivity. And my colleagues on the other side of this vote, and by the way, this isn't Democrats versus Republicans, but my colleagues on the other side of the vote, when I said to them, what, why wouldn't you vote for this? It was as if I was an alien from another planet. They couldn't understand why I wanted this language in, and I couldn't understand why they wanted this language out. And so we decided, several of us, to create a congressional caucus on anti-Semitism to teach not only our constituents, but our fellow members of Congress about anti-Semitism and insensitivity and coercion and bigotry and bias. And we had a great response. It was uh, bipartisan, it was co-chaired. I was one of the co-chairs, uh, Eliana ross Leighton, a wonderful Republican member of Congress in Florida who sadly just announced her retirement from Congress. I do not understand why anybody would announce their retirement from Congress. <laughs> and Congressman Ted Deutsch from Florida and Congressman Peter Wexler, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, Peter Wexler uh, was, uh, was a co-chair as well. And uh, our first guest to come to one of our hearings uh, was Professor Deborah Lipstadt. I had called her up and I said, would you be available to come to Washington to talk to members of Congress? And before I could even give her a date, she said, I'll be there <laughs> and gave me a date. And it was standing room only in that room that day. Members of Congress from all over the country, from different political persuasions from Tea Party to Progressive, Congressional Black Caucus, Congressional Latino Caucus, Congressional Everything Caucus, they all wanted to hear from Deborah Lipstadt. And why is that? Because she is the most eminent expert and historian on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust in the world today. That's why. Uh, she is the Dorot Associate Professor of Modern Jewish and Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. In 1993, Dr. Lipstadt published Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, the first full-length study of those who attempt to deny the Holocaust. The, met, the book was met with wide acclaim and was declared by the New York Times to be one of the notable books of 1993. And many of you know this story. Following publication of Denying the Holocaust, she was sued for libel in the UK by Holocaust denier David Irving. 
Now, she could have ignored the case, but she refused to ignore the case. She chose to fight it, and she won that case. And in 2016, her story was made into a film called Denial. I hope you have seen it, and if you haven't seen it, see it. Uh, her most recent book, Holocaust and American Understanding, looks at how Americans have understood and interpreted the Holocaust since 1945. She served as a historical consultant to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She was appointed by President Clinton to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, in which she served two terms. In 2005, she was asked by President George W. Bush to be part of a small delegation, which I joined you on, uh, which represented the White House at the 60th anniversary commemoration of the liberation of Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Deborah Lipstadt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you, Steve, on this important endeavor. Um, I think it's going to make a tremendous mark, not just uh, for LIU, but for all the communities surrounding LIU. And uh, you've gone only up in what you're doing since you left uh, Congress. So. Uh, maybe you can advise all your colleagues. <laughs> maybe they're looking at you and saying, Steve has it so good, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. But I usually don't like to start speeches with a joke. I think that's a cheap shot. If you're going to win your audience, win them by what you have to say and not by making them laugh. But this joke, I promise you, has to do with... Uh, how's that for a quick exit? Um, this joke, I promise you, has to do really with the topic at hand. And it goes back to the days of the refuseniks, the Soviet Jews fighting so hard to get out of the Soviet Union. Many of you not only remember that, but were actively involved in that movement, which was successful. Um, but this was the height of Soviet anti-Semitism. And if you visited the Soviet Union in those days, you knew the stores were empty. You'd go by a store and there'd be a few things in a dusty uh, a, a sh a window in the, in the, on the street. But when you went in to ask if any of those things were available, they never were. There was nothing there. Um, so word goes out in Moscow, dead of winter, that one of, the, one of the shoe stores is going to receive a shipment of shoes. And there's great excitement. People line up starting in the middle of the night. It's sub, sub, sub zero. But they don't care. They want to get those shoes. And they line up. Um, and morning comes, and the store's late in opening, and finally, after a couple of hours, the, the, the manager of the store uh, comes out and says, we're not going to have enough shoes for everybody online. All the Jews go home. So Jews left the line. A couple of more hours proceed. Everyone is freezing. He comes out and he says, we're not going to have enough shoes for everybody online. All people who are not members of the Communist Party go home. So all the non-members of the party go home. Then a few more hours, and people are just frozen solid, but they want those shoes. He comes out, he says, we're not going to have enough. All people who are not veterans of the Great War of World War II go home. So they left. Finally comes out, he says, we're not going to get any shoes today, so everyone go home. So as two veterans of the Great War walked away wearing their medals, but they walked away from the store, frozen solid, one turns to the other and says, those Jews, they have all the luck. <laughs> so why do I start with that story? Because I think one of the first things to understand about anti-Semitism is that it is a delusion. It is delusional. Think about some of the charges that the anti-Semite makes. Uh, the, Jew is, the Jews are all capitalists, rich capitalists. The Jews are all communists. The Jews are pushy. They like to be in places that people don't want them. I'm staying in the hotel, the castle, you know, which I now, Steve gave me the story that it was built as a sort of one-upsmanship when, when the uh, Otto Kahn wasn't allowed to join the local golf clubs because he was a Jew. He built a bigger one to look down on all of them. But, you know, Jews are pushy. They want to belong to the clubs that don't want them. Or Jews are insular. They, they live in the ghetto, so to speak. They, they only want to deal with one another. Well, how can you be a capitalist and be a communist? How can you be pushy and be insular? It doesn't make sense. 
But to the anti-Semite, it makes complete sense. Because the prism, the, the prism through which the lens, through which their view of the Jew is refracted, is coated with an anti-Semitic veneer. And on top of that, it is a conspiracy theory. It's not a prejudice. It's not just a prejudice. It certainly is a prejudice. And think about, I'm going to talk about conspiracy theory in a moment, but think about the etymology of the word prejudice. Pre-judge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. As a colleague of mine likes to say, you meet your stereotype walking down the street long before you meet the person. So you see an African-American walking to you, towards you, you know your stereotype. You see uh, a woman coming towards you, you know your stereotype. You see a Jew coming towards you, you, you immediately classify them. If it were not so dangerous, it would be completely stupid. But to say it's stupid diminishes, or it's only stupid, diminishes the danger. But it's certain, prejudice is certainly that as well. But it's also, as I said a moment ago, a conspiracy theory. A conspiracy theorist sees something they can't quite explain, or something they don't quite believe. And they're going to find someone to blame it on, someone to hold responsible. And the more information you give to them disproving the validity of their theory, the more convinced they are of it. I think some people like to think that the moon landing took place on a sound stage in Nevada, Utah. They can't quite decide, but they know it's not on the moon. So if you were to meet one of those people and to, share, to give them, say, look, I have, I got, I, I have these moon rocks. They are unlike, geologically, they are unlike anything you would find on Earth. They're just not, there's nothing on Earth that is made up of that composition. They had to come from off the Earth, from the moon. And the conspiracy theorists would say to you, who gave you those rocks? And you would say quite definitively, I got them from NASA. NASA gave them to me to disprove your conspiracy. And he said, huh, NASA, well, what do you expect? Of course, they're in on the conspiracy. This is a person who government is always lying to you. And so too, whether you're going back to the Middle Ages, Jews poisoned the wells. Bonnet plague came. They couldn't explain it. Jews poisoned the wells. You look for the person to blame about whom, now this will be complicated, but about whom the society is predisposed to think bad things. So I'm not going to blame someone that, you know, well, another joke, but one that fits, I think, here as well. Um, this was supposedly told by Jews in Nazi Germany in the 30s. A Nazi official is giving a speech about all the things, all the injustices that have been done to Germany. And each time he gives, we, we lost the war, it was the Jews' fault. Our money collapsed, it was the Jews' fault. Uh, we were beholden to all the nations, we had to pay them tremendous reparations, it was the Jews' fault. Each time it was the Jews' fault. Finally, after he had done this a number of times, somebody in the audience yells out, and the bicycle riders. And he stops, he says, why the bicycle riders? And the person says, why the Jews? But why the Jews? Because it fits into the person's predisposition of feeling about that person. And by the way, the same thing can be said of racism as well. It's the same sort of construct. So how do you deal, how do you fight? I remember one of the final questions of the panel uh, earlier this evening was, what do we do about it? Uh, and I think the people on the panel, the law enforcement officers said education. Of course, that's not their job. That's, they're doing it, but that's not their job. They shouldn't be the ones left to do that. We ask enough of them. They shouldn't be having to educate, but many of them are, and, and doing it well, but still. Um, but, but how do you fight something without building it up in importance? And I think that's the challenge that faces us. Shortly before my trial, it was, uh, we had been through, at that point, three or four, three years about of preparation. I was nervous. I was anxious. I was standing in my lawyer's office in England, 
And I said to him, Anthony, I want to beat this guy. I want to destroy him. I really want to decimate him. Now, this was a lawyer who had worked for about a year and a half, two years maybe, pro bono, and then had continued to work on a very reduced rate and worked through the trial on a reduced rate, had many people in his firm working on it. He looked up at me and said, He's, David Irving's not that important. David Irving was the one who sued me for libel. And I, I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> that was a pause. I don't know why you're laughing, you know? <laughs> um, I would never say words like that. Um, he said, he's just not important. I said, so explain to me why you chose to work. He, he was a man who's, the case prior to mine, he had represented Princess Diana. Remember she had that divorce suit from that, what is his name, Charles? Um, so this was a guy who could choose his cases. Why had he chosen to work pro bono on a case he didn't think was important? And he said something to me very telling. I, I talk about it in my, in my book, and actually it was adapted in the movie as well. He said, think about fighting David Irving as you would the dirt, and he used a more graphic word for that, uh, you'd step in on the street. He said it has no intrinsic importance unless you bring it into the house, you get it into the carpets, and as many people here know who've had kids, let's say, who've dragged in <laughs> dog droppings from the street, no matter how much you clean the carpets and how much you order them to come and do deep-seated steam cleaning, you're never happy. The happiest day you have regarding your carpets is when those carpets go and new carpets come, right? Because you're sure never quite clean. He said, think about that like that. If you drag it into the house, you're in trouble. But if you work, if you stop before you go into the house and clean it off your feet, and maybe you have to work really hard to get it out of every crevice of your shoes and make sure it's completely off the soles of your feet, then you're okay. And I think it's a wonderful analogy for us. Again, the last question being asked in the pan of the panelists, what should we do, is the tension between fighting the anti-Semite without making them important. Fighting the anti-Semite without, or the prejudicial person of any prejudice, but in this case we're talking about anti-Semitism, without building them up in, in significance. David Duke is a nothing. He was head of the Ku Klux Klan. That's, I mean, if you want to talk about hate groups, that's something within the hate groups. But now he's a nothing. Yet, if we continually focus, we want to focus on him, because when he does terrible things, but how do we do it? without building it up in significance. It's the same problem we have, and the panel was talking about it, in terms of graffiti, anti-Semitic graffiti. I'm not diminishing the troubling nature of anti-Semitic graffiti, especially drawn in front, anywhere in front of a synagogue, whatever it might be, but especially if it's in front of a synagogue or in a Jewish household or in your rabbi's house or carved into your car and your rabbi, or, or someone who's known as a Jew, active in the Jewish community, you know that the person doing it connected it in that way. Yet, how do, since so many of these things come from younger people, how do we fight it? And I, we must fight it. I'm not saying we shouldn't fight it. But how do we fight it without creating copycats? He got on the evening news. I want to get on the evening news. He got attention. I want to get attention. Again, I'm not saying it's not important, but our first, sometimes our first instincts, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to get publicity about it. I'm going to make sure this never happens again. It's our first instincts. We're going to organize groups to go and cover it up and wipe it out, and the youth groups are going to come, et cetera, et cetera. How do we do that without inspiring others to engage in copycats? So there's a challenge here in how we fight this anti-Semitism. But there's another form of anti-Semitism. This too was mentioned, I think it was in, in your question in the, in, towards the end of the panel, about social media. Because social media has really changed the game. It allows people to find one another who never could find one another before. And it allows young people to be indoctrinated in a way they could never be indoctrinated before. 
And though police officials, educators will say to you, know what your child is doing when he or she is on the internet, it's a nice statement, but you can't, you know, oh, the, uh, I'm on the internet, I'm reading the New York Times, or I'm uh, reading whatever, and it's a very respectable thing, you say, that's great, and you walk away, and with one click, there's someplace else. Facebook, you can't, you can monitor, but you can only monitor so much. And it's, it's a real problem that we face. I don't have the easy answer to it. I don't think there is an easy answer. Anybody who tells you they have an easy answer to this problem, save your time and don't listen to what else they have to say. I'm, I'm being, here I'm being dead serious because there are no easy answers. But I think there's something else that we, and I know many in this audience are Jews, but um, that almost doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that any society which has within it anti-Semitism, racism, any form of prejudice, is not a healthy society. And that includes, that's not, you know, it's not to say, well, I, there's anti-Semitism, but I'm not Jewish, so it, it's a bad thing, I don't like it, but it doesn't really concern me. Or there were racist things, the N-word was put outside, and it's a bad thing, but it doesn't really concern me. It does concern you. It concerns you even more if you're not of the group. No healthy democratic society can abide having that open hatred in its midst. So I would say to the Jews in our midst and to the non-Jews, to the non-Jews, anti-Semitism, your ox may not be the one that's being gored, but your society is being harmed. And I would say to the Jews who say, well, I, the only thing I really worry about is anti-Semitism, is that's a very short-sighted way of looking at the problem. The, the young person or not so young person who is marching in Charlottesville yelling, Jews will not replace us, and blood and soil, which are overtly Nazi-based, anti-Semitic, obviously anti-Semitic, kind of ha have anti-Semitic connotations and uh, overt connotations, is the same person who will engage in racist and homophobic and Islamophobic kinds of statements. And though I know at times we say, well, this is, this is against us and it's been going on for so long, and don't ask me to care about others. Care about others not out of the goodness of your heart, though that would be a good reason, but care about others because of your own, and so at the very least, your own self-interest. If you don't want it happening to you, if you see it happening to someone else, know that it spreads. It may start with the Jews, it never stops with the, at the Jews. It may start with other groups, it will reach the Jews. The other thing I want to say, and I think this is very important, um, Anti I, I, in graduate school, I went to Brandeis Graduate School and had one, a wonderful professor, Ben Halpern, and he used to say that the one place the far right and the far left meet is on anti-Semitism. And I'm just finishing a book now on anti-Semitism. I'm just doing the final edits. And I was, as I was telling Steve Israel over dinner, um, what I've done is I've taken all the letters and emails and conversations that I've had with both students and colleagues over the past three, four years about anti-Semitism. In fact, it started shortly after I, you had me up on the Hill uh, to speak to um, your colleagues. Um, I had shortly before written an op-ed in the New York Times about the rise of anti-Semitism. It was right after the Gaza War, and I made the argument that this is not connected just to Gaza. It goes beyond Gaza. Um, it started before Gaza, and it will continue after Gaza. Um, but I've been, since then, and so of course I began to get many letters and inquiries, and students come to me and ask me about things. Um, so I've been keeping notes, and what I did for the book is take all those things in terms of what the students communiques and create a composite student, and all the other communiques and create a composite non-Jewish colleague, because I've had lots of uh, conversations with my non-Jewish colleagues, and it's an exchange of letters. I've taken the composite notes and made them an exchange of letters. 
How do you define anti-Semitism? How do you spell anti-Semitism? I hate to criticize the people who have so graciously brought me here, but I wouldn't spell it with a hyphen. For your next, hopefully this will be the last conference on the topic, but methinks there'll be more. Um, I would spell it without a hyphen. Why? Because anti-Semitism, you know, if you're anti-immigration, anti-taxes, anti-expansion, anti-whatever, whatever stands on the other side of the hyphen stands alone. Immigration, taxes, whatever it might be. There is, this is not being against Semitism. Anti-Semitism has one meaning and one meaning only, hatred of Jews. That's what the inventor of the word, Wilhelm Marr, in the end of the 19th century in Vienna when he created the word, what he meant. And too often when, when it was translated into English, some printer put in the hyphen and we've been stuck with it ever since. But some people will say, oh, I'm not an anti-Semite. I can't be an anti-Semite even though I've said horrible things about Jews because I'm a Semite. Are you going to erase the hyphen? Is that what you're headed to? <laughs> you can wait till afterwards. Um, how do you spell it? How do you define it? There's one definition that I sometimes tell my students, and when I start with this, they think I'm joking. Um, but I cite a definition that's credited to the famous philosopher uh, Isaiah Berlin. We would say Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin in, taught at Oxford, I believe it was, or Cambridge one of the two, um, in, and lived in London, an uh, uh, identifying Jew. And he used to say, anti an anti-Semite is someone who hates Jews more than is absolutely necessary. <laughs> Sounds funny, right? But it's really, it's a very good, it's a good work. And I've also heard it um, credited to Jackie Mason. My guess is Mason was more likely to hear it from Berlin than Berlin from Mason, but you never know. Um, but it's a very good definition. Think about it. Let's take it in, case, in the case of African American. You're driving on the road and a driver cuts you off in a very aggressive fashion. Aggressive and dangerous, you're almost driven off the road, you almost lose control of your car. You come home and you say, a driver drove me off the road, I almost, I, I could have died, I was, I was inches from dying. That's a statement. If you come home and you say, a black driver drove me off the, off the road, that's a racist statement. Now, if a police officer stops you and says, I saw what happened, give me a direct description of the driver so we can put out an all points bulletin to, to catch this guy, and you say, driving a red car, a young, da, da, and he was African American, that's not a racist statement. In other words, there it's relevant. Is it relevant? Is the information relevant? And by the way, it can also come philo-Semitism, love of Jews, can also, if for the wrong reason, be flipped into anti-Semitism. Think about it. You're in trouble with the law. And you need a really good lawyer because you're in big trouble. You're as guilty as sin. Um, so you say, oh, I'm in big trouble. This is really bad. I'm going to get myself a good Jewish lawyer, a smart Jewish lawyer. He'll be able to get me off. And then you know what? He can't get you off because you're guilty of sin. So that smart Jewish lawyer becomes that terrible Jewish lawyer. In other words, the Jewish should be irrelevant, but you can slip right into it. In fact, I'm reminded of the fact that in the book of Proverbs, Sefer Mishle, it says about the honeybee, I don't want your sting and I don't want your um, honey. Just stay away from me in that sense. So the phylo can turn into the, into the sting. But something, I think there's something else that's very necessary for us as a community, uh, certainly for the, for the Jews amongst us to think about, think about very seriously. And someone else asked this in the preceding question about uh, anti-Semitism coming from the left, particularly from amongst Jews. Now sometimes people, when, when Jews are anti-Semitic, sometimes people call them self-hating Jews. You know, they're contemptuous of themselves, so they're you know, engaging in anti-Semitism. I think what we're seeing today, and this comes particularly from the left, um, those people are not self-haters at all. 
They're very proud of themselves. They're very proud of themselves for being more ethical, more honest. You know, you, can, you know how you can identify that? anybody who begins a sentence and says, as a Jew, I dot, 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 dot. The minute you say that, run for the exits. Because you're, you're getting someone who is using their Jewish identity to hide behind what is often un, unfair criticism. Not always, but often unfair criticism. But I think we'd be very long, wrong to only see anti-Semitism on the left. And believe me, it is there on the left whether it's in the BDS movement, whether if you know the English, the British situation, Ken Livingstone, the former mayor of England, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, the leader of the Labor Party, who has never met an anti-Semite he can't abide. Um, in other words, he abides them all. Um, or, you know, some of the uh, leftist, far, far left liberal groups. But if you only see it there, you're being very blind. Now, I think Charlottesville was a wake-up call, as we described it earlier, for many people. But it's on the right, and it's on the left. It's in both places. And if you consider yourself a person of the left, maybe moderate left, maybe slightly center left, and you only see it on the right, you have no credibility. And if you're a person of the right, and you only see it on the left, you have no credibility. In other words, the idea is to see it in your own midst first and try to fight it there and not just look to the other end of the political spectrum. It's hard, it's difficult, but I think it's exceptionally important. Um, but I think there's something else that we, we have to think about. There's, been a, there's a lot of talk about BDS and we're concerned about BDS, we're concerned about the situation on campus. There are campuses where it can be very uncomfortable to be a pro-Israel, openly identifying Jew. But the truth of the matter is BDS, and some people said we've got to fight it with uh, legal matters and we've got to fight it by getting the presidents of universities to come out against it. BDS's objective is not B, D, or S, not boycott, divesting, or sanctions. BDS is objective and the objective of other groups that preceded BDS but are intimately now involved in BDS is the denormalization of Israel or it can also be called the toxification of Israel to make anything associated with Israel toxic to make anything associated a lecturer on medieval art a scientific innovation to, to raise the issue that it comes from Israel, therefore it has something wrong with it. So it becomes even harder to fight because we're not fighting the boycotting. No university is gonna boycott. What we're fighting is something much more insidious. But at the same time, now I'm gonna flip sides, having acknowledged it's a serious problem riddled with anti-Semitism. At the same time, many of you I know have just sent off uh, children, grandchildren to, to universities. We also have to be careful about the message we send them off with. I read a letter that a mother published in a newspaper recently. She said, this is what I told my child before they going, went off to university. That I'm very proud of them, they're going to a good school, but they've gotta be prepared to run into anti-Semites and they're gonna encounter anti-Semitism and they're gonna face anti-Semitism. It was all about how your four years of college is gonna be, one of the major motifs is gonna be anti-Semitism. Now if I were a young person going off for a college experience, I would make, even if I were a very serious Jew, I would make a decision, I would say, you know what? I want to have four years of a healthy, positive experience. I don't want to spend four years fighting. I don't want to spend four years strategizing how we're going to attack this or defend ourselves against that. I'm just going to go undercover for four years as a Jew. I'm going to self-censor. I need a place to go for a high holiday service. My parents have friends in that town. I'll go to their house. Passover, I'll come home. Hanukkah, everybody loves Hanukkah. They all like jelly donuts. It's a celebration. Anyway, usually Hanukkah comes by the time we're home for exams anyway. In other words, we can't give them the message that that's their whole experience because it's not. 
So we also have to be careful about finding the balance. I'm reminded of an essay that uh, the famous uh, professor, historian, Salo Wittemeyer Barone, who he held the first chair in Jewish history in the United States. He was at Columbia University, the dean of Jewish history, widely, widely respected and renowned. He wrote an essay many, many years ago called The Lacrimose Conception of Jewish History, the tearful conception, lacrimose, tearful, sad conception. And he was mainly a medievalist. He knew the medieval period like the back of his hand. When, when Israel was looking for a historian to testify at the Eichmann trial, to put anti-Semitism in context, they didn't look down the block, at, uh, down into the valley at the, at the Hebrew University, which was you know uh, a quarter of a mile, half a mile from where the trial was being held. They brought in Baron. Baron talked about the fact that we often see Jewish history, particularly the medieval period, as pogroms, riots, expulsion, pogroms, riots. Exp we see it as, as one unending chain of tearful things. And he said, by doing that, we lose sight of the great intellectual achievements, the great communal achievements. Our federation systems, our communal systems are based on what was going on in the medieval period. You couldn't arrive in a town, in a Jewish community, if you were a stranger, without being welcomed by the welcoming stranger committee. You couldn't, you know, if you were ill, you would never sit alone at home. There would be the visiting sick committee. Things were parceled out. We took care. It was self-government and self-regulation and self-taking care of ourselves in the most extreme and beneficial way possible. But to only see the bad is to lose sight of all that. What Baron was saying is, don't ignore the bad, it's there, but find the right balance. We have to be very careful for ourselves, but especially for our young people, your children, your grandchildren, whom I teach in my classes, not to give them the message that the reason to identify, the reason to be part of this enterprise we call the Jewish community is because of anti-Semitism, is because of persecution. It's the same message that uh, I know uh, colleagues of mine who are African Americans who teach African American studies hope that the parents of their, their students in their classes who are African American give them, don't only identify out of the racism, identify out of the positive. And certainly we Jews, out of the wonderful cultural history we have, religious history we have, intellectual history, shared experience, affirming. Our support of Israel should not just be support because Israel is under duress and there are those in the world who would like to see an Israel-free world, but because of the positive stuff. So even as some, the, this is coming from someone who spends her waking, has spent the past three years, every waking moment, free moment, writing this book on anti-Semitism, teaching about it. And when I'm not doing that, I'm teaching about the Holocaust. So, you know, I could be very depressed, but... Um, I fight it. I know it's important. Believe me, I wouldn't fo focus on it. it's important. But the more I study it, the more I encounter it, the more I realize also we can't lose sight of all the good stuff of our tradition, of our history. We can't turn Jewish history only into, and Jewish tradition in what is done to Jews, but what Jews do. We can't make Jews object. We also have to make them subject. Thank you very much. Let me ask you a question if I can, yes. uh, Professor. Um, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya uh -huh. uh, had a conference in June I attended. And there was an expert on BDS at that mm -hmm. conference. She happens to live in Westchester. And she I had a theory about BDS. I want to hear your, right. whether you agree or disagree. Her theory was that BDS is not an inherently anti-Semitic movement. It is inherently an anti-power movement. That is that young people uh, in, in college, they, 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 in her view, they don't really oppose Israel because it's the Jewish state. They oppose Israel because it is a powerful state against less powerful. Do you agree or disagree with that? that? I think that's a very, very smart and insightful way of looking at it, and I'm going to go back and add it to my book. You'll have to tell me who it is so I can cite my source. Um, in fact, what I often say about BDS 
is that BD, if you look at the founding documents of the BDS movement, you will find their elements calling for a right of return. It's the uh, end of the Jewish state. Clearly, the people who organized this, Bargudi, and th doesn't want to even talk about a two-state solution. He says two-state solution would suggest that the other side has some justification, which we don't think it does. However, many of the students who clamp on to BDS First of all, have no idea that that's there. The prob many of them couldn't find Israel, it's hard, but they couldn't find Israel on a map if they tried. But it's anti-power, and it's a way of thinking, well, we want to change the stalemate in the Middle East, so this will help change the stalemate. But I think that it's also that attraction of Israel, small as it is, is the Goliath, and, and this is a way of, attra of attacking it. I think it's a very, very insightful analysis. Thank you. We have some questions. Professor, I wonder if you'd, you'd comment on, on something that's it's, it's very topical, I think. In the 1930s, the America First movement was a, a movement, uh, Charles Lindbergh, Henry Ford, and others, uh, um, and, and it was a, maybe an insurgent movement. Today, the America First banner has been adopted by one party or by one party's leader, and there are an awful lot of people out there who find an attraction to that. Would you comment on how that might affect anti-Semitism? Right. Um, I think it's, a, thank you, it's a good question. Um, America First, as you rightly cite, was uh, Charles Lindbergh. In fact, many people say that if Adolf Hitler, if after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, if Adolf Hitler hadn't joined with the Japanese in the fight against America, we would, might not have ever gone to war against the Nazis, but we would, because the thing that scared America the most was a two-front war. We would have just fought the Nazis. Um, and, and that was, you know, the, the, the well, certainly uh, America first under Lindbergh. Lindbergh made his famous speech. He was in the Midwest. He made the famous speech that it was Jews and industrialists who were getting us into uh, this fighting of uh, Germany. Um, it was deeply anti-Semitic was deeply, deeply anti-Semitic. Um, I'm not sure that all the people who today go around talking about America first, including possibly our president, have the full sense or even partial sense of the history of the movement. Um, I think someone like Steve Bannon does, um, even though he's now out of, out of the White House, but I'm not sure everyone does, but I find it very, very disturbing. Um, I think America is exceptional. America is exceptional in the way it has crafted a country out of people from a multitude of backgrounds and faiths and heritages. America is exceptional, and we look at our founding do documents and the ideas contained in there. It's exceptional. It is absolutely exceptional. But to go around in a cheering kind of bombastic way that we have to be first, um, makes me uncomfortable because I'm not sure what it's about. Uh, I'm not sure um, if it isn't like the same kind of thing you get with ardent sports fans at an uh, ice hockey game. Oops, I know, it's the wrong example to use in this part of the world. Uh, uh, but, you know, a soccer game in another country, in Europe or something, um, in England, where you get the, the, the passion turns over into a fire that turns over into danger. And um, I think there are many things we can be first in, but just to be first for the sake of being first leaves me very disturbed. Next question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could um, speak a bit to the relationship between the Black Lives Matter movement and BDS on campus. I'm deeply personally concerned about that and find it very difficult um, over the last year to have conversations with friends who are from communities of color that you know see the importance of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, but with that are also now defending the BDS movement, and if you could just speak if this is a real threat, yeah. and also how we can respond to that when we're having these conversations. It's, it's a very good question. I have two, two or three letters concerning that in, in the book. Um, what you're talking about is a phenomenon where we have seen progressive groups, you know, I use progressive as far to the left kind of thing, um, become 
take on, well, let me go back. It goes back to something called intersectionality. Intersectionality is an idea that was conceived of or adapted by a law professor at Michigan quite a few years ago. There was a legal case, um, I'm blocking on the, the name of the plaintiff, but it was against General Motors. And the case was from a group of African American women who were arguing that they suffered a double bias. They couldn't get jobs in the front office because they were black where women were getting jobs and better paying jobs, and they couldn't get the good jobs on the assembly line because those went to men. So they said they suffered a double bias, and she applied, she didn't invent the term in intersectionality, but she applied it to this case. And it's a good concept because it shows us how sometimes people face a double bias in because of, you know, we're not just one thing, but two things together. Um, but what has happened to intersectionality today is it's come to have a whole other meaning. And that means that if you are oppressed, it doesn't matter how you're oppressed, whether you're oppressed for racial reasons or part of a geographic uh, uh, conflict, such as would be the case in Israel-Palestinians, -Pal um, we share a bond. And what many anti-Israel um, slash pro-Palestinian, but I'm using both those terms together, groups have done, especially, but not only on campus, is bring to their side uh, groups that make no sense to be part of it. For instance, I was talking to Morty Shapiro, who's the president of Northwestern University. He's a friend, and a couple years ago, it was just right after the BDS resolution was being debated by the Northwestern Student Council. And he said to me, with like, the most utter amazement, I mean, he wasn't, he's too smart to have been amazed, but he still was shocked by this, um, the fact that uh, the resolution had been supported by the gay uh, LGBTQ group on campus. And he said, where would you rather be gay? In Riyadh or in Tel Aviv? <laughs> you know, but, but what's happened is, um, the, the, it becomes part of the whole thing. So what's a racial conflict is, is glumped onto a geographic con conflict. Um, what I say, and it's, it's not an easy solution what I'm saying, I, but I've said it to students of mine who, are, who, who see themselves as progressives and part of these groups. I say, you've got to stay at the table. You've got to stay as part of the groups. Wear your T-shirt that says progressive and Zionist and proud of it. It's not easy. I have friends in England, many friends in England, who are Labor Party people. And I say to them, how can you be part of this group that is with a leader who, and, and so many people around him who have been so, you know, he gives a speech, our great friends from Hezbollah and Hamas. Give me a break, you know. Um, uh, but, but they have convinced me. They say, Deborah, if we leave, first of all, we believe in the social uh, program of the Labor Party. But if we leave, we leave it to the anti-Semites. We've got to be there, as uncomfortable and as difficult as it is for us to be there. So I think that's very important. Now I want to flip it around. And someone here mentioned to me, um, a me I think it was you, a uh, meeting held at uh, the, uh, convened at the UN, not really part of the UN, um, on BDS uh, for students. And it, they, get, they get a broad array of students. Something happened this past year at the meeting. I don't know if it had happened before, but it was reported uh, by a very fine reporter who was there, and I spoke to her afterwards after I read her article, um, that there were students there from J Street U, from the J Street uh, uh, student group. And they, had, they knew they were going into a conference that was convened in part by ZOA, which is part of the right, and that they were going to be possibly a bit uncomfortable because of their left orientation. Um, but when one of them stood up to ask a question, she said, you know, I'm against settlements on the West Bank, but I'm also firmly opposed to BDS. And how do I convince students who are against the settlements on the West Bank that BD and who want to boycott them that BDS is a bad thing? And before she could finish her sentence, she was booed. She was booed as soon as she identified herself as from J Street U. And one of the speakers, who happened to be a legislator from, from the South, 
um, state legislator who's been very active in pro-boycott and anti-boycott legislation on the state level, stood up and said, J Street is an anti-Semitic organization. And the 2,000 students began cheering. Now, those same students had been told when they registered for the conference, you know, students in organizations always come wearing their organization of their T-shirt, their T-shirt their, their with their name of their organization on it. So the J Street kids were wearing their J Street T-shirts, and they were told at a Jewish gathering, you should change your shirts or cover them up. We can't guarantee your security. Now, we're shocked when Jews have to, Jewish kids are told when they're going on the teen tour of Europe, no yarmulkes while we're in Paris or Berlin or wherever it might be. Don't, wear your, don't bring your birthright backpack. Save that for when we get to Israel or something like that. But this is happening in a Jewish group. And in fact, I was, I was uh, moderating a panel about a year ago at the JCC in Manhattan, um, which had the two professors, Todd Gitlin from Columbia and a professor from uh, Gerald Steinberg from Israel. Gerald is very much to the right. Todd is pretty much to the left, and we were talking about BDS. Both of them are absolute opponents of BDS. And one student stood up, and when she, a, a graduate student at Columbia, she, uh, in, in the Middle East Department, so she studied in Israel, and then she went into the belly of the beast, the Middle East Department at, at Columbia. And she, she, and Gerald Steinberg probably cl proudly claims her as one of his students. So in other words, she's been trained by someone of the right. And she stood up and said something very powerful. She said, when we're debating BDS on campus, the students who have the most cred, street cred, credibility, with the students on the left are the students from J Street and the students who are associated with the New Israel Fund and the students from leftist Jewish organizations. Because they're the ones who speak a common language. Hearing that convinced me We've got to be, as difficult it is, as hard it is, as hard it is to talk to your friends about this, we've got to stay in the conversation. Question over here. You raised a concern about Jews wrapping our brains around minority biases. Anti-black, anti-Muslim. Mm -hmm. That came out so strongly in the campaign, our political campaign last year, yet 25% of the Jews elected our president. Where are their minds in looking beyond We've that. had such a nice conversation. We're nine minutes away from the end. I was gonna get out of here and get a good night's sleep. You know, you should always start, stop three questions before the end, and that was, that was three. You know, I, I can't explain it. I can't explain it. We live in a very mixed up world, and what I'm afraid of, you know, as someone who has lived in Israel, spends lots of time in Israel, uh, you know, family in Israel, cares deeply, deeply about Israel, is I'm afraid that some people are, are so anxious, concerned, for, I'm gonna try to put a positive, because uh, I think it is out of fear and out of concern, about the future of Israel, that they're, they're keeping company, so to speak, in quotation marks, with groups that don't have their best interests at mind, or certainly Jews' best interests at mind. So. A lot was made about education, but nobody said how or what we're supposed to teach the kids. Could you, as a professor and educator, tell us what they should be teaching from age um, up? I think that, you know, it's like I, I grew up, many of us grew up in these kind of households. Intolerance for any kind of intolerance. Intolerance for prejudice, and it doesn't, own, not only when your own ox is being gored, to use the Talmud's uh, way of speaking, um, but for other groups, both out of morality and out of strategy. Morality because, you know, it says, if I'm only for myself, what am I? But what's the second half? If I'm only for myself, what am I? So certainly out of that, but also out of strategic, if we're not at the table with other groups, if we're not in conversation with other groups, if we're not um, under empathizing with other groups when they're attacked, how can we expect it the other way around? I can't tell you exactly how to educate every kid, but I can tell you 
Um, what did they say in South Pacific? You gotta be taught to hate. You've got, it comes from somewhere. We're not born hating Jews. We're not born hating African Americans. We're not born hating gay people. We're not born hating Muslims. We learn it. We learn it. And I think that that's most important. All right, we have time for two more questions. We celebrated when the White House had seders with President Obama, uh, Hanukkah dinners, celebrations, Rosh Hashanah greetings. And yet, according to the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the number one anti-Semitic incident of last year was former President Obama's acquiescence to UN Security Council resolution, denying, in part, our connection to Jerusalem. How do we reevaluate our relationship to former President Obama, and which is the real person, the first one or the last one on his way out of office? Yeah, I would question the statement that the number one anti-Semitic incident of last year was that resolution. I think it's a much more nuanced resolution, um, and uh, I, I'm openly, uh, I was a supporter of, of Obama, I was quite open about that. I don't think everything he did was right. I think there were some very serious mistakes made. Um, but I wouldn't talk about a real or a not real, and I think that uh, as much respect as I might have for the Wiesenthal Center, that that kind of number one anti-Semitic event is exactly the kind of rhetoric we don't need in this fight. Um, no, no. No, it's, 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 um, it's exactly the kind of rhetoric that heats things up. You can disagree with it. You can say it's politically wrong, it's historically wrong. Of course it's historically wrong. Um, but but to, to, to do that, it doesn't advance the fight. Um, and I also would point out that who is the rabbi who right now is closest to President Trump? So, the head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Okay, we're going to take final question over here. Yes, there you go. Uh, Steve, I've been doing community organizing work and global development work for 45 years. And uh, we've been in communications and I've worked with you many times in the communities. And, but I hate uh, when there's a but. Yeah. I'm on the left. I'm from the left. I started Bernie Sanders for Long Island. Yeah. And I co-started that. And so coming from the left, I feel out of place a little bit today. Really? You know, from a number of things that have been yeah. said. I think it's really important for someone such as yourself, um, who, who self uh, talks about being a person of the left and involved in the left, uh, that you look closely at what some of the, th the, some of the things that are being said on the left, just as I would say to someone who's on the right, look closely at what's being said on the right. The person on the right will have no credibility in addressing the people on the left and calling them on their anti-Semitism, just as you would have no credibility calling the people on the right for the people in the right. Not saying you wouldn't have credibility, but to the people on the right. We each have to look into the political homes where we find our place and find those who are engaging in anti-Semitism, just like we would do if they were engaging in racism or engaging in some other ism that we are strongly opposed to, and call them out on it. Call them, recognize our own shortcomings. Um, and maybe again, and I say this to the Jews in the audience, of which I know there are many, but not only, um, we're approaching the Amim no Ra'im one week uh, Rosh Hashanah, and, and, and the message of that, I'll end in a rabbinic mode. Um, Perfect. Uh, the, the whole message of that is look unto yourselves. Look, go look in the mirror and see where you, where we each, not you, all of us have failed all our mistakes and correct those before we go correcting the others. Um, if we can do that, then maybe it'll be a better world. Thank you all very Thank much. you, Professor Lipstadt. Thank you all very much.
We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.